to the Apocalyptic Gospel Podcast, where we explore the gospel that Jesus' earliest disciples heard and what the last several decades of historical studies have clarified about this first century Jewish message. Listeners, welcome back to the Apocalyptic Gospel Podcast. I'm Josh Hawkins, and as always, I'm here with Bill Schofield and with John Harrigan. Howdy, guys. What's going on? Hello. Not a lot. Amen. Good Actually, a lot, but <laughs> just scratch that. <laughs> Not a lot, but actually a lot. Yeah, yeah a lot. that's kind of the way that life always seems to go. Uh, well, listeners, it's great to have you again this week. We want to continue our look at the Tanakh, and specifically today, we want to spend some time in Jeremiah. But in our last few episodes, we've been looking at the book of Isaiah. Specifically last week, we spent some time talking about messianism, and we looked at the servant songs from Isaiah. We talked about how Israel is called to be God's servant, and that's laid out in a way that has to do with Israel's role and and a purpose for them being called his servant, and that was to be a light and a blessing to the rest of the nations. We talked about Isaiah 53 and the classic passage that is well known, uh, and we talked about how This is really Isaiah drilling down into a singular servant within the collective servant of Israel for the purpose of bringing the collective servant back to God. Uh, And we spent a lot of time developing that and talking about that last week. But again, today, we want to spend some time in Jeremiah. Jeremiah is, of course, the longest of all of the prophets and really the longest book of the entire Bible uh, in terms of of number of words. And so there's definitely a lot to talk about. But uh, we mentioned Jeremiah a fair amount, actually, already in our episode on Deuteronomy, specifically season three, episode 16, and just a few episodes before this. And we talked about Jeremiah in context to the rediscovery of the book of Deuteronomy in the events uh, that we saw in 2 Kings 22, when Hilkiah was in the temple and opened up a closet and was like, oh my gosh, I wonder what this scroll is all about. Oh my (laughs) gosh, it's Deuteronomy. It's the... (laughs) This is bad. Let's bring it to Josiah and we should figure out, let the king decide what to do with it. Well, and so today we want to develop some of the events of Jeremiah, specifically as we've seen in the past, uh, how this covenantal cycle as laid out in Deuteronomy, the cycle of a prophet coming and rebuking Israel from turning to other gods and then the people of Israel not responding. And so then they're sent away into exile, but then eventually they... Uh, repent and God restores them back to the land. This is, you know, this simple cycle that we've talked about in in our episode uh, 16 from this season on Deuteronomy. But the events of Jeremiah really follow this pattern. Uh, And so so we want to spend some time developing this, talking about covenant maintenance in the book of Jeremiah, and then even how this is apocalypticized and pushed forward. Yeah, and the book is, you know, it's kind of hard to find structure to the book of Jeremiah, because it it becomes a little bit monotonous at times, just a a relentless uh, prophetic accusation, uh, a poetic prophetic accusation uh, that gets repeated over and over. uh, That's really just a a crying out uh, against the idolatry and the sins of Israel and that the covenant is not in good shape. It's, It's being broken. It is in a bad condition. And that God is going to fix the relationship, the covenant uh, between himself and Israel uh, through coming judgment. And so that kind of climaxes in the first 25 chapters uh, with chapter 25 and the declaration of 70 years of exile. And then uh, you get more of kind of the hope of restoration in uh, chapters for Israel in chapters 26 through 45. Um, and of course, there's a, a number of particular, pe- you know, chapters 29 through 33 that uh, have a real heavy emphasis on the restoration of the covenant and the relationship in the future. And then the book kind of ends in chapters 46, uh, you know, to the end, 52 of the judgment of Babylon, who God is going to use to fix the relationship, but then he's going to uh, punish in the end. So. Uh, there, it's it. The, if the cycle remains at the center of reading the book, then it has the the monotony can be uh, <laughs> can be 
uh, handled. Yeah, mit- it's mitigated a little bit. Uh, mitigated. Yeah. I, I'm trying to find that in a way that's not derogatory towards right. the book. The book is awesome, right. but uh, <laughs> it does get it does get a bit long and and uh, intense. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, and I think also the um, like acknowledging the novelty of the cycle so explicitly played out in Jeremiah is helpful too. Yeah, because even even the emphasis that we've gone over in the last few weeks on restoration in Isaiah is not so explicitly laid out in context to this pattern, right? The indictment. And idolatry, scattering and exile, and then return to the land and restoration. So this pattern really starts to pick up here in Jeremiah, and this becomes like a central, like we all think of this pattern now, either, you know, from listening to the podcast or if you just heard about the pattern elsewhere. Um, this is, we just kind of come to understand the pattern is normal at this point, but there was a time when it wasn't like that. And so the, the impact, like Josh was pointing out of, you know, framing Jeremiah as the son of Hilkiah, who is the man who discovered the book of the law in 2 Kings 22. This is impactful. And then the, by the end of Jeremiah 1, you have Jeremiah's calling, and he's getting the, he has the vision of the almond blossom, the almond tree. And it's a play on the, uh, the word for almond and the, the basically his calling is so tell these people that I am watching over my word to perform it. And this essentially becomes the framework for Jeremiah is that they had just discovered the book of Deuteronomy and the, the framework for the whole book of, of Deuteronomy and for the ministry not Deuteronomy of Jeremiah and the ministry of Jeremiah is God is confirming through him that he is watching over his word in the Torah to do all that he said. Yeah. So that's basically the larger overview. Yeah, and and Jeremiah's uh, I think, you know, the the most Deuteronomic kind of of the prophets. So if Deuteronomy isn't, you know, substantial to you, then Jeremiah just becomes kind of uh the really loud prophet, yep. who, <laughs> the the weeping prophet, yep. right? He's he's kind of the emotional one. <laughs> um when when in reality he's expressing the heart of God for the restoration of the coven, covenant in the Deuteronomic cycle which really plays out in the adultery metaphor that gets used uh, quite a bit in Jeremiah and so we thought you know we thought we would read some kind of substantial since Jeremiah is so large we would bless our listeners with some some longer readings in Jeremiah to give them the feel the feel of Jeremiah <laughs> so right. chapter 2 sets up the book and uh, and kind of introduces the the feel of of the indictment but it's it's personal and it's not you know it's not legalistic but the Deuteronomic cycle is is intensely personal to God and the restoration of the covenant. So chapter 2, the word of the Lord came to me saying, go and proclaim in the hearing of Jerusalem. Thus says the Lord, I remember the devotion of your youth, your love as a bride, how you followed me in the wilderness in a land not sown. Israel was holy to the Lord, the first fruits of his harvest. All who ate off of ate of it were held guilty. Disaster came upon them, says the Lord. But then they end up going astray. So the the whole idea is that things were right in the beginning. Things have gone astray, but God wants to set uh, the relationship right. And so then uh, down in chapter two, uh, verse twenty five, the problem. I mean twenty three. The problem is is that Israel doesn't recognize or acknowledge. Uh, the the brokenness of the situation, which is a theme that plays out through Jeremiah, where you have the false prophets that are saying everything's cool with us, it, you know the 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 covenant is is doing fine, and so chapter two verse twenty three, how can you say I am not defiled? I have not gone after the balls. Look at your way in the valley. Know what you have done. Arresting. A restive young camel interlacing her tracks, a wild ass at home in the wilderness, in her heat sniffing the wind, who can restrain her lust? 
None who seek her need will weary themselves. In her month, they will find her. And so Israel is kind of projected as um, as an animal in heat, you know, driven by idolatry and uh, led astray. Uh, verse 26, as a thief is shamed when caught, so the house of Israel shall be shamed. Their kings, their officials, their priests, their prophets, who say to a tree, you are my father, to a stone you gave me birth. They have turned their backs to me and not their faces. But in the time of their trouble, they say, come save us. But where are your gods that you made for yourself? Let them come if they can save you in your time of trouble. Uh, for you have as many gods as you have towns, O Judah. Uh, so then it goes on, you know, the judgment is coming at the end of chapter 2. For you shall be put to shame by Egypt as you were put to shame by Assyria. Uh, from there also you will come away with your hands on your heads. For the Lord has rejected those in whom you trust. You will not prosper through them. And so the judgment is coming to bring about repentance and to bring about a realization of the brokenness of the situation, which will then finish the cycle of restoration. Go, chapter 3, verse 12, and proclaim these words toward the north and say, Return, faithless Israel, says the Lord. I will not look on you in anger, for I am merciful, says the Lord. I will not be angry forever. Only acknowledge your guilt that you've rebelled against the Lord your God and scattered your favors among strangers under every garden tree, and have not obeyed my voice, says the Lord. Return, O faith, faithless children, says the Lord, for I am your master. I will take you from one city and two from a family and will bring you to Zion. And then, you know, verse 17, kind of the, the, the close, the, the climax of it. At that time, Jerusalem shall be called the throne of the Lord, and all nations shall, shall gather to it. To the presence of the Lord in Jerusalem, they shall no longer stubbornly follow their own evil will. In those days, the house of Judah shall join the house of Israel. Together they shall come from the land of the north the land to the land that I gave your ancestors for a heritage. So you kind of in the first, you know, chapters two and three, you get the full cycle of the the covenant is in a very bad situation. I'm going to bring judgment and discipline to awaken, uh, uh, awaken repentance and a return, and then restoration will happen. So kind of the Deuteronomy 30 will uh, be brought to completion. Yeah, yeah, this is exactly what we have laid out throughout the book of Jeremiah. Another passage we could reference would be Jeremiah 16, with the same pattern of covenant breaking, exile, repentance, and return and restoration, right? So you get Jeremiah 16, starting at verse 9, where thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, behold, I will silence in this place before your eyes and in your days the voice of mirth and the voice of gladness, the voice of the bridegroom and the voice of the bride. And when you tell this people all these words and they say to you, why has the Lord pronounced all this great evil against us? What's our iniquity? Well, they, you shall say to them, Jeremiah, because your fathers have forsaken me, declares the Lord. They've gone after other gods, they've served and worshipped them, they've forsaken me, have not kept my law. And because you have done worse than your fathers, for behold, every one of you follows a stubborn evil will, refusing to listen to me. Therefore, I will hurl you out of this land into a land that neither you nor your fathers have known, and there you'll serve other gods day and night. I will show you no favor. Therefore, behold... The days are coming, declares the Lord, when it shall no longer be said, as the Lord lives who brought up the people of Israel out of the land of Egypt, but as the Lord lives who brought up the people of Israel out of the north country and out of all of the countries where he had driven them. For I will bring them back to their own land that I gave to their fathers. Right. So again, just another example of this Deuteronomic covenantal cycle, laying it out of God maintaining his covenant, why he's going to scatter them, because they've turned aside from the covenant, and why he eventually will regather them for them to be able to serve the purpose for which he elected them. Yeah, uh, that that last motif there gets repeated a number of times um, in Jeremiah, Yeah, which is significant, right? Because what it's doing is it's projecting forward a deliverance greater than the deliverance of Egypt. Right. And that is definitely going to get picked up on later on. It's massive. But... Uh, like uh, Jeremiah 23, uh, is similar, um, it's an indictment against the, the leadership. And starting in verse 1, Woe to the shepherds who destroy and scatter the sheep of my pasture, declares the Lord. 
Therefore, thus says the Lord your God, uh, the Lord, the God of Israel, concerning the shepherds who care for my people, you have scattered my flock and you've driven them away and you've not attended to them. Behold, I will attend to you for your evil deeds, declares the Lord. Then I will gather the remnant of my flock out of all the countries where I've driven them, and I will bring them back to their fold, and they will be fruitful and multiply. And then he goes on just a little bit lower, and he says, Behold, the days are coming. I will raise up for David a righteous branch, and he will reign as king and deal wisely and shall execute justice and righteousness in the land. Uh, the, the language of that's always been so striking to me because we're, we're uh, quite a, we're, you know, we're like 400 years removed from David. And when the Lord yeah. thinks about what he's going to do, he's actually doing it for David's sake, right? It's still like, it reminds me of when you get to the Exodus and it says that the Lord remembered what he said to Abraham. And that's why he did the Exodus. And so you hear the Lord remembering what he said to David. And for David, he raises up a righteous branch. Yeah. And, uh, and then you have just below that again, therefore, behold, the days are coming in light of the branch of David, um, that they will no longer say, as the Lord lives who brought up the people of Israel out of the land of Egypt, but as the Lord lives who brought up and led the offspring of the house of Israel out of the north country and out of all the countries where he had driven them, then they will do on their own land. So this essentially becomes a repeated motif where there's going to be a deliverance that eclipses even the deliverance of Egypt. Yeah, so in order to get this greater deliverance and uh, of Deuteronomy 30, you have to have the playing out of the Deuteronomy 28, which is, you know, for example, in Jeremiah 30, where you get the language of Jacob's trouble. Uh, verse 4, these are the words that the Lord spoke concerning Israel and Judah. Thus says the Lord, we have heard a cry of panic, of terror, and no peace. Ask now and see, can a man bear a child? Why then do I see every man with his hands on his loins like a woman in labor? Why is every face turned pale? Alas, that day is so great, there is none like it. It is a time of distress for Jacob, yet he shall be rescued from it. So there's a projection of the divine judgment that's coming in light of the restoration. It goes on in, in chapter 30. For thus says the Lord, your hurt is incurable, your wound is grievous. There is no one to uphold your cause, no medicine for your wound, no healing for you. All your lovers have forgotten you. They care nothing for you, for I have dealt uh, you the blow of an enemy, the punishment of a merciless foe, because your guilt is great, because your sins are so numerous. So then it goes on, verse 18, thus says the Lord, I'm going to restore the fortunes of the tents of Jacob and have compassion on his dwellings. The city shall be rebuilt upon its mound, and the citadel set on its rightful site. Out of them shall come the thanksgiving, the sound of merrymakers. I'll make them many, and they shall not be few. I'll make them honored. They shall not be dis disdained. So, the again, the language, the same kind of language of there's coming this judgment. There's you don't recognize how many are your sins, how severe the situation is, but the judgment is coming to kind of shake Israel into repentance, and then will come the restoration uh, at the end. Yeah, 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 guys, this is great. I think it's really important to see these passages as a playing out of the cycle that without understanding. 2 Kings 22, Hilkiah and Jeremiah being the son of Hilkiah, and then the framing of the prophetic tradition around the rediscovery of the book of the law, and specifically how Deuteronomy highlights this covenantal cycle. It just makes, as you said earlier, John Jeremiah long and confusing and just like, well, this is just monotonous. <laughs> but then you frame it within the covenantal cycle and it makes a lot of sense as to why Jeremiah is saying these things over and over and over again. With such passion. Yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. So speaking of the apocalyptic literature and how this would get press forward to its ultimate end, I think uh, we should spend a little bit of time talking about 
what we see throughout the book of Jeremiah and how certain themes are pushed forward to their ultimate end um, in the apocalyptic literature. Yeah. Um, Jeremiah is, like I, like I said a little bit earlier, um, we, we take a lot of this pattern for granted now that it's pretty normative to the way that people read the prophets, you know, the pattern of exile and restoration and, um, or exile, repentance, restoration, whatever. And, but, you know, that this is fairly novel as far as like seeing it actually play out within history. This is fairly novel for Jeremiah and his audience. And, and so if you've heard, if you've heard us say before, if you want to understand Jesus and the prophets or Jesus and the apostles, you have to understand the prophets. And then, you know, if you want to understand the prophets, you have to understand the book of Deuteronomy, sometimes what I say. But this is really what we're talking about. What we're talking about is, is what we'll call covenantal determinism. And if you're not familiar with the term determinism or defi- divine determinism, what what determinism a lot of times means in Christian theology is is some baggage that was picked up in the Reformed world uh, just after the Enlightenment. Because in the Enlightenment, everything was about um, de-emphasizing the collective and re-emphasizing the, ho- the individual, right? It's why you get places like the United States birthed out of the Enlightenment with the you know, their emphasis on the sovereignty of the individual over the monarchy. And so the, 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 the uh, reformed movement, the Reformation, is a product of this. And so when they think of determinism, they think of an individualistic determinism. And so what divine determinism is, if you're familiar with the reform movement, is that God is orchestrating everything around one's life. Like your car broke down because of determinism, you stubbed your toe because of determinism. Well, that's you know, I'm I'm being silly there, but but everything happens individually because of God's ordination, and but that's not really how the the context of God's sovereignty plays out in the, in the scriptures, right? That's not how He chooses to express His sovereignty over the heavens and the earth, and the way that's really emphasized over and over again is specifically God expresses his sovereignty over the heavens of the earth in context to the covenant. And so it's not that there's an individual determinism, but rather there, God is ordaining history in context to the covenant. This is covenantal determinism. And this becomes really influential, like history itself is being moved by God because of the covenant. This is massively influential in apocalyptic literature later on in the prophets this is a this is huge deal like if you think of the book of jubilees for example the structure of the book of jubilees as a whole assumes that god ordains these seasons of life of history not of life but of history and he basically moves history according to these periods and you have in Enoch, you have the same thing in First Enoch 89, where he summons these 70 shepherds to oversee the 70 weeks of years from Daniel. But if you think about it, like these, these concepts aren't around before that. Like God's sort of sovereignly orchestra- orchestrating history around the covenant. That's, you know, like, sure, we have in Isaiah things are, the good things are coming. This is happening. But you don't have like a real specific God is ordaining and orchestrating history this way and that way because of the covenant. Like we just read, he's going to raise up a branch because of David, for David. And so in the same way, he does these things for the covenant. Well, yeah, Bill, I think in taking this idea of covenantal determinism and seeing it individually uh, not individually, rather, but in terms of God ordaining history and context to the covenant, I think we see this so clearly in a passage like Jeremiah 25, where Jeremiah 25 is outlining the fact that Israel is going to be in captivity for 70 years. And this is pretty significant in terms of the chronological nature of things and how it gets developed. But let me just read this, Jeremiah 25, verses 11 through 13 
Again, drawing on same lang- uh, similar language that we saw earlier in Jeremiah. Moreover, I will banish from them the voice of mirth and the voice of the glad- voice of gladness and the voice of the bridegroom and the voice of the bride, the grinding of millstones and the light of the lamp. The whole land shall become a ruin and a waste, and these nations shall serve the king of Babylon seventy years. Then, after seventy years are completed. I will punish the king of Babylon in that nation, the land of the Chaldeans, for their iniquity declares the Lord, making the land an everlasting waste. Right? So you get this idea of 70 years, Israel's going to be in captivity. And then at the end of 70 years, I mean, a very specific chronological period of time, the Lord will act in accordance with his covenantal promises to restore Israel and bring them back and defeat the nations. Yeah, and it really seems it seems like Jeremiah twenty five is kind of a a substantial. I don't know if you'd say a turning point, but it it becomes um, it becomes a, a a jumping off point for a lot of the apocalyptic literature because you have it's not just that this covenantal cycle is uh, is there, but it it has specific chronology that's that then gets attached to it. It's 70 years. So, you know, in, in Daniel 9, you have Daniel is reading Jeremiah 25 and sees that it's 70 years, and therefore he repents and cries out, you know, for the nation, and we're returning to you. And then the Lord reveals at the end of Daniel 9 a real specific kind of timetable that is an, kind of an extrapolation of that 70-year discipline, now there's going to be a further timetable unto the final restoration. And so you get a lot in Jewish apocalyptic literature, you know, once you have a timetable attached to this covenantal cycle from Jeremiah 25, then you have a a timetable attached to the restoration. And, you know, 4th Ezra 12 and the the eagle vision is a kind of a, an exposition on the vision that Daniel saw. He says it explicitly, you know, and then uh, chapter 13, the man from the sea and the restoration of the 12 tribes and all of that. Uh, it's a lot of that, for example, is uh, kind of an extrapolation of the timetable being attached to the covenantal cycle uh, that wouldn't have happened. You know, Deuteronomy 30, 28 through 30 would have been there regardless, but then you add in chapter 25 and you start to put chronology to that covenantal determinism that God is going is determined and he is he's going to bring it to pass, but now he's set kind of a timetable to it. Yeah, it's not like you get these random ideas like from the rest of Daniel, you know, the 1260 days, the time, times, and a half a time. Those aren't random, right? It's, it's sure there's debate about the meaning of those things, but it's, it's all still in context to the covenant right. and the playing out of, of the covenant in light of all of that. Yeah. And like, like, uh, Second Chronicles at the end, it actually attaches it to specifically It's 70 years because that's how many Sabbath years for the land were ignored right? right. in their apostasy. And so it it kind of becomes like a, it's almost like a, he says that this is the word of the Lord through Jeremiah, but the word of the Lord through Jeremiah was just because there were 70, there were 70 years and that they ignored the the kind of jubilee or the, the, the rest cycles for the land. And so that's a that's another interesting covenant connection where it's it's not even just broadly even the number is determined by the covenant. Yeah. Right. right. And I think you, you know that you get the numerology a lot of times numerology is what weirds out people with Jewish apocalyptic literature but right. the yeah. numer- the numerology wasn't weird and esoteric for them. The numerology right. simply backed up the covenantal cycle. Yep. But when you extract the covenantal cycle out, then all you have is weird esoteric numerology, and thus right. you get the book of Revelation, and we never talk about it. And so, right. if if the numerology <laughs> if the numerology is set in context to the covenantal cycle, then the numerology becomes you know more bearable and not as strange. Yep. It has meaning, right? Even, right. even you know, getting to Daniel 9, and all of Daniel 9 is just, it's the 70 years that were denied the land, 
And then all Daniel 9 is saying is that the angel comes with the bad news that you remember Leviticus 26, if you still don't repent, then I'll have to multiply your exile by 70. Right. Yep. It's like, oh, okay. So it's just, <laughs> it's just all it is. It's again, it's numerology, but it's completely bound in a pretty straightforward reading of the Torah. Yep. It's not bound in, like you said, esoteric ideas. That's a, that's a great way to, to frame that. And again, like I said at the beginning, um, here is where you have, uh, really it's where you have the prominence of exile and redemption taking kind of center stage in the conversation, um, is in Jeremiah. And like whether it's the land or it's, you know, the specific sins that are, you know, developed, like John brought up the, the adultery motif that goes throughout. John, you did a great job. Made, it reminded me of like a, it's like a really graphic country song. That's another way we can think of the book of Jeremiah <laughs> in context to the adultery motifs. But, but what, what we have is, is this kind of exile and redemption it, it it not only is influential, it is simply, or it essentially grappling with exile and the hope of redemption essentially frames Jewish leadership and every single Jewish sectarian group moving forward after Jeremiah. Because it, it's it's what's the answer to exile? Is is the answer, you know, uh is the answer zealotry? Is the answer repentance? Is the answer, you know, whatever. And from the Maccabees and the Hasmonean Empire that formed there through the Sadducees and the Pharisees, these movements are essentially grappling either with exile or with the threat of exile. And how should one respond? Right. Yeah, Bill. Well, I think with that in mind, it's important to see, again, Throughout the prophets, specifically after Jeremiah, you have this scenario that's created over and over again where you see this restoration from exile, and in that context, God does a work in the hearts of the people so that they never have to be exiled again. Right. And we right. see this playing out in a huge way in a passage like Jeremiah 31 and the promise of of the new covenant, right? So I'll just read this passage, we can talk about it a bit. But Jeremiah 31, we know the passage, verse 31, Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I'll make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah, not like the covenant that I made with their fathers on the day when I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, my covenant that they broke, though I was their husband, declares the Lord. Again, similar themes we've already been talking about, like coming out of Egypt, the husband and and harlot imagery uh, earlier on in Jeremiah 2. Verse 33, this continues, for this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, declares the Lord. I will put my law within them and I will write it on their heart and I will be their God and they shall be my people. And no longer shall each one teach his neighbor and each his brother saying, know the Lord, for they shall all know me from the least of them to the greatest, declares the Lord, for I will forgive their iniquity and I will remember their sin no more. So again, a restoration from exile in the context of God doing this work in their heart that will prevent them from being scattered from the land ever again. Right. And that's another and that's another way that like our post enlightenment world definitely influences the way that we read that. Because like you're saying, the the context for a quote unquote new covenant was the only thing that was exciting about that was the end of exile, right. the perpetual end of exile. Right. Like they would stay in the land, in the blessing, in right relationship with God. So that's what's really emphasized, and that's what's exciting about the hope. And the means to do that was the, the work that God was going to do in the heart. But when they hear New Covenant, that's what mostly what they're thinking about. They're not primarily thinking about the individual work of God that God was going to do in the heart, but about the collective promise that God would put them in the land and not remove them again. Right. Which again reminds it 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 takes us back to the Torah again in Deuteronomy 30, when all these things, starting in verse one, when all these things have come upon you, the blessings and the curse which I've set before you, and you call them to mind among all the nations where the Lord your God has driven you. 
and you return to the Lord your God, you and your children, and obey his voice and all that I command you today with all your heart and with all your soul, then the Lord your God will restore your fortunes and have mercy on you, and he will gather you again from all the peoples where the Lord your God has scattered you. So what, what is this predicated on? When you return to the Lord with all your heart and with all your soul. And so he says, if you're outcast, you're at the uttermost parts of the heavens, there the Lord will gather you up, etc., etc. And then he will make you more prosperous and numerous than all your fathers. And the Lord your God will circumcise your heart and the heart of your offspring so that you will love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul that you might live. So the, the whole context for the final restoration from it, exile in Deuteronomy has to do with this work that God will do in the heart to basically perpetuate their standing before him. And so that's the the value of it is that they'll all be restored and all of their fortunes will be restored. And the way that's going to happen, ha- you know, is in context to the circumcision of the heart. And the, in the language of Deuteronomy, it's a new covenant. Yeah. So, you know, as uh, you don't get a lot of talk about the new covenant just because it's it's part and parcel with the whole cycle in general as, you know, prophetic tradition moves forward and apocalyptic tradition develops. So, for example, in, in first Enoch two, I mean, sorry, first Baruch two, which is apocryphal, um, you get first the first two chapters of first Baruch are like very much like the beginning of Daniel nine. They have the same feel and uh, based on kind of the 70 years of exile and, and the repentance and. So in chapter two, at the end of chapter two, it says, For I know that they will not obey me, for they're a stiff necked people, but in the land of their exile they will come to themselves and know that I am the Lord their God. I will give them a heart that obeys and ears that hear. They will praise me in the land of their exile and will remember my name and turn from their stubbornness and their wicked deeds. For they will remember the ways of their ancestors who sinned before. I will bring them again into the land that I swore to give to their ancestors, to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and they will rule over it. And I will increase them, and they will not be diminished, and I will make an everlasting covenant with them to be their God, and they shall be my people, and I will never again remove my people Israel from the land that I have given them." So the new covenant is connected with the the finishing of the covenantal cycle, the restoration from exile, the restoration to the land. So, you know, then the apocalyptic tradition kind of sets this in context to the day of the Lord and the resurrection and the restoration of of the kingdom to Israel and the Davidic uh, Messiah. And, and so you get different groups and sects that are that do talk about the new covenant, for example, in Qumran, they viewed themselves as kind of coming uh, out of exile in a way, and they're the new covenant community. Um, and you get language of it in the New Testament, but it's not substantial. I mean, Paul basically hardly ever talks about it, except two two minor references to it, and you really only have Hebrews eight. But even in Hebrews 8, it's not like a, a, a theological fixture. It's just saying that there's a, a better sacrifice than the blood of bulls and goats. And God is renewing us inwardly to, to walk in righteousness, but it's still within the broader framework of, you know, the broader apocalyptic framework uh, that that uh, was presumed by everybody. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Well, speaking of the apocalypticization of the New Covenant, let's spend just a little bit of time here at the end of our episode and talk about how the book of Jeremiah and other themes in Jeremiah developed within Jewish apocalyptic literature. Well, an easy an easy thing to point to is the Baruch tradition, right? Because you have 1st, 2nd, 3rd, 4th Baruch and and uh, and basically, this kind of all derives from the fact that Baruch is this prominent scribe in Jeremiah, and so his and and so a lot of the ideas from Jeremiah get reiterated and and kind of teased out uh, apocalyptically with the with the writings of Baruch from first to fourth Baruch, 
And so, but but Baruch in in the book of Jeremiah is this scribe who assembles all of his words and sometimes functions as a little bit of a mouthpiece between him and the king. But that's one of the main ways that we can kind of look at the influence of Jeremiah is actually in the Baruch tradition, which we we talk about a lot. We don't reference the Jeremiah tradition, but we reference uh, second and fourth Baruch a lot. And but really, this is kind of it's a it's a, again it's a playing out of some of the ideas from the book of Jeremiah in in the uh, in kind of Jewish apocalyptic literature is what is what that tradition is. Yeah, and it, you know, Brooks kind of strange because in Jewish apocalyptic literature, because uh, a lot of it revolves around the patriarchs, the Testament of the patriarchs, Enoch, you know, Adam, the life of Adam and Eve. Uh, you know, Jubilees, it's, it's basically a rehash of, of Genesis leading up to Moses. And so you, it's strange that Baruch plays such a large influence and place in Jewish apocalyptic literature. Um, and it's, it's almost, you know, this would be speculatory, of course, but it seems like the, the patriarchs are far enough back that you can appropriate them to, you know, push things to their apocalyptic end, but Jeremiah is kind of closer, you know, so it's a little bit harder to kind of put words into Jeremiah's mouth. Uh, But Baruch, you know, who is kind of, he's Moses, uh, he's Jeremiah's Aaron to Moses, you know, he kind of, he, he's his mouthpiece a lot of times and goes and speaks to the Kings on his behalf. And in Jeremiah 32, 36 and 45, uh, so in apocalyptic tradition, the role gets kind of switched and, and Baruch becomes the primary player and Jeremiah becomes the secondary player. So in second Baruch, you have in chapter nine, Baruch and Jeremiah fast for seven days. And then in chapter 10, it says, and after, and it happened after seven days that the word of God came to me, Baruch, and said to me, tell Jeremiah to go away in order to support the captives in Babylon. And so in the book of Jeremiah, you know, Jeremiah never goes to Babylon. He ends up going to Egypt. But in right. in Baruch, and then it gets repeated again in chapter 33, it gets repeated in 4th Baruch, um, where Jeremiah is sent by God to Babylon. And I don't know how to explain that or why the contradiction, but that's just how the how the, how it goes. So, right. so Jeremiah goes to Babylon, but Baruch becomes kind of the pastor, the shepherd in, in Jerusalem. And so it says, verse 3, You, however, stay here in the desolation of Zion, and I shall show you after these days what will happen at the end of days. And I spoke to Jeremiah as the Lord commanded me, and then he went away with the people. But I, Baruch, came back and sat in front of the doors of the temple, and I raised the following lamentation over Zion. And so then it kind of, you know, the, the lamentation goes on. So you get the retaining in the in the Baruch literature of the lament uh, f- over, over Israel, right. and but you get it you get also the revelation of the end of days. So you get kind of the apocalypticizing of Jeremiah in the Baruch literature, if that makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. It totally makes sense. And really unique how the apocalyptic writers of the day decided to, uh, decided to frame Jeremiah in that way. Makes a lot of sense. That's good. Yeah, so th- then you get kind of the the strange story that happens not just in Baruch but also the lives of the prophets and Second Maccabees too, where uh, you know Jeremiah is supposedly the guy who takes the the uh, the tent, the the tent of meeting, the al- the altar of incense and the ark, and he takes those before Babylon destroys the temple, and he hides them in a cave near Mount Nebo. And that uh, it's going to be hidden there until the end of the age and the eschatological glory reveals them again and restores Israel. And so, uh, you know, Jeremiah and Moses are kind of connected in those kind of telling of the stories, um, which, you know, 
kind of puts Jeremiah in that eschatological role. You know, it kind of comes up in the Gospels where some say that you're Elijah, some say Jeremiah. Some So that kind of seems to be where that idea of the, the eschatological uh, uh, role of Jeremiah at the end of the age could play out. But the book of Jeremiah itself is not super apocalyptic. It's mainly centered around this one disciplinary act in the exile. But then that kind of intensity of that prophetic cry then gets projected forward to the end of the age and the final restoration. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and and another theme, I mean, we didn't really touch on, but I think it's just worth mentioning, of course, is the projection of the theme of the destruction of Babylon all the way into the book of Revelation and the apocalypticizing of that theme as well. Um, and, right. you know, that that's yeah. for, that could perhaps be for another day. But uh, but guys, yeah, great to, to discuss some of these things today, important topics uh, in terms of how Jeremiah would be understood and, and uh, the framing of the covenantal cycle uh, and God continuing to maintain his covenant with Israel. And so we want to look next week uh, at the book of Ezekiel, and we want to uh, really develop a lot of these same themes and see how uh, the covenant is continuing to be the focus and why this all should be seen through that lens. We want to spend some time talking about the book of Ezekiel next week. So listeners, we hope this has been provoking and encouraging. Join us next time on the Apocalyptic Gospel Podcast. God bless and Maranatha. 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 Thanks for listening to the Apocalyptic Gospel Podcast. For more, visit us on our website at apocalypticgospel.com and follow us on Twitter at Apocalyptic Gospel.